follow up with early satellites. This is the International Ultraviolet Explorer, really. I'd like to highlight, present results today from a large number of papers written in the, in the 80s, in the early 90s. And I'd really like to point out that these papers are really, really good. And they discuss, um, they discuss many, many of the things we discussed today in, in quite a lot of detail. And they're, um, it gives you a, a great deal of respect for how much work could be done with such crappy data. Um, and in the end, I'll just start to put the beginning of, um, show the first correlations between Lyman alpha output and the, and the metal abundance and dust abundance in galaxies. And also I'd point out that while Masami's been talking predominantly about Lyman alpha selected galaxies, um, every one of the, um, the, um, the galaxies I'm going to discuss here, we've been targeted observations with satellites which have been pre-selected by either the UV continuum or H alpha or expected UV continuum. And um, this is a very different selection function. <coughs> we have no prior information on Lyman alpha and that didn't indeed didn't come at all until 2008 in the local universe. This is the timeline, roughly, of, um, of ultraviolet satellites that I've, or ultraviolet space-ish telescopes that I've deemed interesting for this set of talks. The first vacuum UV observations of extragalactic observations were done from a sounding rocket in 1977. This is called the FOT, the Faint Object Telescope. It flew on for about a day above the atmosphere at 100 and something kilometers. This is the International Ultraviolet Explorer that took over. It was the real workhorse for UV observation for almost 20 years, or 15 years at least. Um, we've had since 1990 on the sky the Hubble Space Telescope, still going now, and this has been really where we've got all the, the detailed information about Lyman alpha output from galaxies from, or from HST. We have a few satellite in brackets here because it was also very useful in the UV but didn't quite go as bright as Lyman Alpha, but um, if you care about Lyman Beta, for example, then that's your satellite. And um, also flying for 10 years between 2003 and 2013, the Galaxy satellite, very different from the other ones. All of these were would do pointed observations only. Galax had a huge field of view, but um, was the first way we could really do proper surveys looking for Lyman Alpha at low Z. So, honestly, hands in the air, please, if you recognize this telescope. You've seen this picture before. All right, two maybe. Three. <laughs> it's really a ray gun, right? This is the Faint Object Telescope. And it flew in 1977 for about a day above the atmosphere. <clears throat> It's so a 40 centimeter mirror there, and I'm assuming that's a secondary, and it's going to reflect light back there, but I don't really know how it works. This is the first ultraviolet spectrum ever taken of a galaxy in the, of an object in the, near UV, in the UV, low Z. It's a 100 ultraviolet, has a resolving power of about 100. Here's a spectrum of Lyman alpha. It's asymmetric, it's not because it's asymmetric Lyman alpha, but because this is a quasar and there's a nitrogen 5 line in there that's blended. Um, yeah, this is 3C273, and this is, yeah, the first extragalactic spectrum. This is the next machine that took over, the International Ultraviolet Explorer. This is, yeah, flew for almost 20 years, or 15 at least years. 12 more years than the mission was planned for. This is great, a great point about UV satellites is that they don't need, you know, cryogens or cooling, and if the detectors don't get badly radiation damaged, they fly until something breaks or until you run out of money. <coughs> also pointed observations target by target, but it had a huge entrance aperture here, like 10 by 20 arc seconds. And you can return broad sort of spectrophotometry resolutions of about resolving powers of about 200. You see a continuum here, UV continuum, a Lyman alpha emission line there from the star forming galaxy. This feature here at the end is real. This is the geocoronal Lyman alpha line that I was arguing yesterday you had to select galaxies to redshift them away from this, and that bright feature is exactly why you have to do that. Um, so this gave us, yeah. So here are some examples of Galax here. Galax had a 50 centimeter mirror here, not so big perhaps, but <coughs> and it flew also for 10 years, and I think it was planned to fly for two and a half, or at least the original, original plan was to exceed something like that. Had imaging cameras mainly, Galax is known mainly as an imaging 
telescope, did all sky surveys of various tiers of the wedding cake. With um, channels at 1500 angstrom in the near, in the far UV and 220, 2200, what we'd call the near UV. Um, but also was capable of doing slitless spectroscopy, similar kind of resolution to the previous telescopes, about resolving power of 200. Spectra looked like this, nice one here, big bright one. Ah, if you look, I mean, this was doing slitless spectroscopy, so it's just the imaging with a, with a disperser in the way, and you take spectrum of every object on the sky, there's a particularly bright one, and you disperse the light in a certain direction, and then on a different position angle, roll angle, you disperse again, and then many, many different um, angles. You can reassemble very nice spectra that look like this, fainter ones that look like this, and like this. And this was really the first machine that led us to survey for Lyman Alpha emitters at low Z. And really the reason lies on this slide. So this is the size of the full moon. This is the size of the galaxy field of view, 1.2 square degree, 1.2 degrees on, on the linear dimension. There's M81. We don't care very much about M81 because we like starburst, so there's M82. There's a box there which describes the size of this image up here. There's M82 in the middle, and each one of these little green squares in here is the size of the HST STIS, the UV imaging camera on HST. This is 30 by 30 arc seconds compared to 1.2 degrees. This is why Galax was a great survey machine. Also shows why HST is a great high resolution machine. <coughs> Here's the HST, of course, mirror is now this big, still sensitive down to 900 angstrom, so you can do Lyman continuum stuff if you want, although telescopes are only about that kind of size effectively by the time you get down to those wavelengths. And it had many cameras that could see Lyman Alpha in principle. Had the, why the first wide field planetary camera one had a filter at about Lyman Alpha wavelength, but its throughput was, I think it was 0.01% in full system efficiency. So that was pretty low and it was never used. Same with the uh, wide field camera tip, well, we've picked two actually. And there are four cameras here that have enabled us to see Lyman Alpha in the local universe. The Goddard High Resolution Spectrograph was the first camera, that, the first spectrograph that was used. When people say that Lyman Alpha transfer is aided by kinematics and outflows in galaxies, outflows from galaxies, that discovery was made with this spectrograph. To do high resolution spectroscopy or higher resolution stuff, you can go to the STIS, Space Tem Based Telescope Imaging Spectrograph. One instrument has ever been able to do narrowband imaging at low Z is the ACS, one we've used very, very much. And more recently, the Cosmic Origin Spectrograph. I'll show a little bit of data from COS now. In one shot, you get spectroscopy across 300 angstroms, <coughs> roughly in lambda. You see nicely exposed the continuum. This is one orbit from HST, not a particularly bright galaxy, and has a Lyman alpha absorption line. Has a couple of settings to do mid resolution spectroscopy, way out to about between 1100 and 1800 angstroms, two high resolution settings. It's very, very efficient, it's very sensitive, particularly at the blue end. Um, it has a small entrance window, like two and a half arc seconds across, so much smaller than the previous instruments I've mentioned. You get high resolution at resolving powers of 20,000, so that's 15 kilometers per second. It's really, really nice. Um, and also have a, a low resolution setting if you want to get all the data in one shot at low resolution. Um, this, of course, this is how Lyman Alpha looks, and one has to be a bit careful with what one refers to as spectral resolution when you work with point sources and extended sources. So this has a this circle here shows roughly the size of the cos aperture. And there's a point source here, which is even unresolved by HST. You're going to get, if you put your aperture here, fine. You get a very compact UV point source. That's going to be going to give you the nominal resolution. And that you're going to get high resolution spectroscopy over the basically the full wavelength range, except for this really small area that you care about, which is Lyman alpha, where this um, very large extended surface degrades the resolving power by the number of resolution elements inside the aperture. And you get kind of bad resolution up there. If you want to get high spatial resolution in Lyman Alpha, you have to get, put a slit in the way, and put a slit in the way involves using the STIS, Space Telescope Imaging, tele Imaging Spectrograph. It's a very nice instrument if you have a very bright source to look at. It's never actually returned high resolution spectra of Lyman Alpha, but in an era where we have 
100 mid-resolution spectra would probably be a good idea to get some while we still have a STIS. It's probably quite an expensive project, but you could argue perhaps that it's worth it. Um, and just briefly, um, Lyman Alpha Imaging, these are data from the, um, from the HCS, the Solar Blind Channel of the Advanced Camera for Surveys, has these filters in the UV, there's 1,000 angstroms, there's Lyman Alpha Rest Frame, there's 2,000 angstroms out here, has these sort of triangular shaped filters with one same red wing in each case. This is because the detector does not, I mean, this is just the decreasing solar blind sensitivity of the detector as you move towards the optical. And then it has these sharp red, sharp blue cutons that, um, that rise very steeply. And if you subtract adjacent pairs of these, you get these narrowish band passes released. And you can pick a galaxy at the right redshift that shifts Lyman alpha into one of these band passes. And you subtract the pair and you get out Lyman alpha. It allows you to work at a number of redshift ranges between the red rest frame and 0.02 and 0.02, well, 0.03 really to 0.1, depending on which one of these windows you want to work with. This imaging, of course, is very useful. The previous spectra taken with COS and with the STIS they involve putting in a very small aperture or a slit. You don't get the global Lyman alpha flux out, so Imaging is a really nice complement to go and do that if you want to get global spectrophotometry. Um, it's nice, of course, do this with HST. HST, by construction, has a, um, has a um, spatial resolution of 0.1 arc seconds and full width half maximum of the PSF in the UV. Um, it's nice, we never had an image before and we jump straight to spectral resolution, which is 10 times better than you can get from the ground. So we go back to this. Those were just the instruments. Now I'm going to talk about some of the, the first observations. This is the, um, the first UV spectrum ever taken of anything in the local rest frame. In the vacuum UV, you have rest word wavelengths on lower X and rest wavelengths on upper X. You see a Lyman alpha line there. There's the ray gun. And the motivation for targeting 3C273 was that we knew how bright it was in H alpha and H beta. We knew she had all passion line observations from the near infrared. And we expected, well, we didn't expect because it was actually the year I was born, but um, they expected to find Lyman alpha over H beta, factor of 40. Um, and that was great because this factor of 40 would make Lyman alpha actually better than, brighter than the, the geochronal Lyman alpha feature. And here is the result. You see the spectrum here, it's in frequencies. See passion lines in the near infrared, H alpha, H beta, metal lines in the far UV, and there's your Lyman alpha line, measured Lyman alpha flux is Lyman alpha over H beta is a factor of only four, so one tenth the expected flux. And this is a nature paper about one object. It's very good. And I found this, this paragraph when I was reading the paper, um, published in 1977, right? And I'm going to, this paragraph I found to be so important, so relevant to what we did today, that I'm going to read it out verbatim. And it says, This remarkable departure of the observed Lyman-Balmer ratio from the expected one is likely to have a major impact on QSO models. The first and most obvious explanation, that the ultraviolet lines are attenuated by absorption by dust, similar to that observed in the ISM, that seems untenable in view of observations of the passion alpha line, that indicate that the hydrogen lines are in fact unreddened. And then it says, but dust which is distributed within the line emitting gas might destroy Lyman alpha without having much effect on the Passion and Balmer lines if the nebula has a high optical depth to Lyman alpha photons. Sentence that I'm going to ignore for a second. And then, whatever mechanisms are, is at work, an understanding of this reduced Lyman alpha to Balmer ratio may lead to a vastly improved knowledge of the physical conditions in QSO envelopes. I really like that paragraph because it explains very nicely, 1977, why we do a lot of the work we do today. This is how data from the IUE looked then that flew a year after this observation was taken. You have these, um, do you call it micro right thing? I don't know what it's called. This is the effective the equivalent of a CCD then. You have here's a bright spot, this is the geochronal Lyman alpha line, and then in increasing wavelength you see the continuum of these quasars. No, these are starbursts, sorry. Um, yeah, here we were pointing target by target, going after, um, 
galaxies that look like this. The first QSO observations are here. So these were the first things done in the, even in the late 70s. You see here, Lyman beta profile, Lyman alpha profile, there's velocity on, on X here. They look kind of the same. Maybe you can't read the axes, but there's a peak here at 3 and a peak at 6. Similar QSO over here. You see H beta line here, very broad and smooth. H alpha, Lyman alpha line up here. And here are tabulated for the first time Lyman alpha um, and H, Lyman alpha to H beta ratios, which came out to be you know, factors of 4, 5, and 2 observationally with no dust corrections in the first set of quasars. And we you know, expected these objects to be <coughs> super bright in Lyman alpha given the huge ionizing output. But they're actually 10 times fainter than we expected them to be. Um, here, if you deredden the Lyman alpha flux and H beta flux, you do in one of the two objects actually get back to a ratio close to recombination. So this one, one of these objects here, I think this one, could indeed be explained largely by dust reddening. The other one manifestly could not. And as it often works with, um, with new instruments, we go and get a few groups, get a small number of observations each, and then somebody comes along and puts them all together into a big sort of meta-analysis. And here are some examples of this now. A few of a few QSOs, 30 odd had been observed, including Seifert's by the end of the 70s. Um, and here on this diagram, you have Lyman alpha over H beta against H alpha over H beta. And what you see is in little spots, they're all objects, all galaxies observed with the IUE, no, all AGN observed with the IUE. And each one of these lines traces a dust reddening curve. And they all start at H alpha H beta is 2.8, so that's here. So all of them start here. And each one of these cases of A, B, C, and D starts at a different Lyman alpha H beta ratio. So there's standard recombination up here, 40, case B, and then somewhat suppressed Lyman alpha, and this shows how the attenuation curves move. And what you notice immediately from this diagram is that this is the standard curve. You see the vast majority of the points lie down here. Lyman alpha over H beta weaker than you would expect. There are a minority that sit above the curve. These are objects that you would, if you'd have put them on the diagrams that Masami pointed out, displayed in the, in the, um, in the previous talk. These were things that you would say had Q above, no, below one. So Lyman alpha is less, actually, extinguished than you would think it would be for the given measured dust reddening. And this, um, and this um, uh, sentence run out. OK, so um, <coughs> yeah, minority is above the curve. Um, and, and these authors write the dust reddening, high density, they discuss all these issues for the first time even before the 1980s, thick H1 columns probably all affect the Lyman alpha Balmer line ratios. <clears throat> but within these data sets, there was no way of finding out what the dominant factor was. <clears throat> you look some more, this is the first Lyman alpha equivalent width distribution published. These, are, of course, are not even for Lyman alpha selected objects, but they all show Lyman alpha in emission. Just the number on this histogram is actually pretty respectable to 30, 30 objects. And you see, Easily a number of objects exceeding the 240 angstrom limit described in the Charlotte and Fall paper that discussed yesterday and also looking at, Q at population 3 objects earlier on today. Of course, these aren't pop 3 objects. They have very hard ionizing spectra from the QSOs. <coughs> um, but this, if you want to see the, the origin of the Lyman alpha equivalent width distribution, then you should look here. Um, so the status at high redshift observations at this kind of time um, there's this diagram of the Partridge and Peebles 1967 paper, first predicting Lyman alpha emission from star forming galaxies. This <coughs> is a review of the state of play by 1994 at high Z, a combination of all the non detections made in the review paper by Chris Pritchett. Um, here is what we would have expected. The, um, this is the sort of modeled Lyman alpha luminosity function at high redshift. And each one of these data points here suggests where we got with some observational effort to detect high redshift Lyman alpha emitters. These are the ones that Masami was talking about yesterday, which could just perhaps have been very close 
to um, detecting Lyman alpha galaxies. This is the, the, um, the uh, roughly the L star phi star point for, um, for, for the predictions. This is where it actually moves to with Lyman alpha emitters. So here, the luminosity function coming through this point would be just coming close to these data points. Um, and of course, this point in the early 90s, we were disappointed by the lack of Lyman alpha emitters or the Lyman alpha emitting star forming galaxies in the universe. Z. Situation was identical at low redshift when we first looked at star forming galaxies. This is the first <coughs> spectrum of a starburst ever taken. Kind of continuum is detected here reasonably well. There's the geochronal Lyman alpha line. This one's a bit close, a bit low redshift, and there's the Lyman alpha position that you expect. And there's a bump there. Maybe it's Lyman alpha, probably it's not. Um, you see what looks like the edge of an absorption line there. The signal to noise is pretty low. <coughs> this is a definite Lyman alpha absorbing galaxy from the same paper, 1981, by Mir and Tulevich. You see here there's a definite Lyman alpha absorption line. Um, this is the first Lyman alpha emitting starburst, 1981. There's um, a strong Lyman alpha feature there. <coughs> These are the tabulated Lyman alpha H beta ratios. Well, non upper limit, upper limit, 6.5, which is again an order of magnitude an order of magnitude less than you would expect for case B recombination. Um, and these authors, first of all, discussed um, the fact that dust and H1 must suppress Lyman alpha. Lyman alpha is probably going to be very rare in normal star forming galaxies or normal galaxies. And that also using Lyman alpha emission to try and find primeval galaxies at high Z is going to be very, very challenging. <coughs> <coughs> of course, more people come along and observe different sets of either blue compact galaxies or um, emission lines or objective prism survey H alpha selected galaxies. We arrive at a statistical sample of six um, with the Lyman alpha emission line there, always far below case B recombination values. This paper by um, Hartmann, Hutkra and Geller <coughs> also discussed the first, I mean began the discussion of H1 content of galaxies using analogous observations of blue compact galaxies, but much more nearby. Here's an example of how we see this. Here's um, a galaxy from one of our surveys with HST, and here is the kind of H1 envelope in which it sits. I mean, we, we do know that star-forming galaxies, particularly the strong starbursts, they do sit in very, very large H1 envelopes, and these objects in the nearby universe, when you measure them, measure the 21 centimetre line with in interferometers, shows column densities, you know, always on the order of 20 to 21 per centimeter square. In the center of these galaxies, this gives you an optical depth for Lyman alpha of, what is it? That minus 13, 10 to the 7 taus, <coughs> which is pretty respectable optical depth. And we would expect, of course, a large, large, large number of resonant scatterings in this kind of medium that's going to suppress Lyman alpha even with a very small dust content. And that was the argument used to describe why these galaxies would have quite weak Lyman alpha. <coughs> oh yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Also, of course, um, and this is a very important point, I think, that um, also at this kind of column density, if the medium is completely homogeneous and you have evenly mixed dust, then radiative transfer in a completely homogeneous medium is going to give zero Lyman alpha output for these for the dust content measured in these galaxies, at least. And this, was, this sentence is, comes and enters the literature in 1984, and it says, we expect a clumpy distribution of scattering material to play a major role in allowing a small fraction of the Lyman alpha of photons to escape. And that's, I think, the way we see the state of play today. Now we arrive at a statistical sample of um, 12 to 14 galaxies, so getting somewhere. And when you get this kind of number of galaxies, you can start to look at the Lyman alpha output, Lyman alpha H beta ratio against things like metallicity. This was done so in a meta-analysis by Hartman in 1988, and also Charlotte and Fall in 1993. This was the equivalent width. This is a Lyman alpha H beta ratio. <coughs> and this, of course, is about the, this is irrelevant, what the stellar population is doing. This is just dependent on the emission lines. So stars do not play a role in this diagram at all. The, of course, the intrinsic 
and the Lyman alpha equivalent width is also going to be set by, set by the intrinsic Lyman alpha equivalent width, which is going to be a function of the stellar population and its age and how many ionizing photons you have per non-ionizing photon. But regardless, the, the images, the diagrams show roughly the same distribution of points. More Lyman alpha output when you have low metallicity galaxies-ish with a lot of spread, but still. And of course, this is nice, right? Um, you can explain this um, that um, a diagram like this, for example, by invoking metallicity. And you say that there are low metallicity stars, they burn hotter, they make more ionizing photons per non-ionizing photon. And that's how you can get this kind of relationship, right? Low metallicity, hotter stuff, higher equivalent widths. But that does not work at all for things like this that are irrelevant, that are for Lyman alpha H alpha or Lyman alpha Balmer ratios. They don't care about what the stellar population is. This is just to do with the nebula and the subsequent scattering. So while this is good, while the metallicity could be important for the properties of the stars, not for the Lyman alpha transfer, because metals, metal ions are things you detect in nitrogen two and oxygen three. Those ions, they don't absorb Lyman alpha. And this, this, this diagram is to explain, you have to be explained, you have to correlate metallicity with the dust content, which is going to happen in a minute. Oh, that's the archive of the IUE sample. Very nice. Um, so here we are showing now, so all of the previous, all of the previous figures that involve Balmer lines have been, have been um, using Balmer line fluxes measured in slits using aperture corrections, which um, carry quite a large uncertainty. Um, this is the first efforts made in 1992 by Daniela Calzetti to actually f produce the, um, the um, to measure Lyman alpha, to measure H alpha and H beta and all of the optical spectrum in apertures that could be then used to match the um, match to use this very large aperture of the IUE. So the IUE aperture in a case like this is going to be as big as the entire galaxy, while the Balmer lines are measured in slits that are about this size which may be accurate for a, a metallicity or a reddening, but not for an intrinsic H-alpha or H-beta flux, which you then convert into the intrinsic Lyman alpha. These were, this was, the spectra were taken from a spectrograph called 2D fruity, of which I really like the name. Um, this is a summary table from a paper by Mauro Giovlisco, written in 1996. This is the, basically all of the, star, the strongly star-forming galaxies present in the IUE archive. There are some famous ones in there, ones with E18, R11 is in there somewhere. Nice galaxies, pets of those that work at Lozi. Um, here they're assembling UV slopes and reddenings and metallicities and Lyman alpha H beta ratios. <coughs> um, all of these pulled out of the literature. But they also... This was the IUE data reduction tools became a lot more mature by this point, and some of these um, fluxes measured that were shown on in previous diagrams changed quite significantly. They noticed significant flux discrepancies in 40% of the galaxies, so you might want to consider this if you go back and read the early IUE papers. Three galaxies changed by up to almost 50% in their flux. Three more turned into Lyman alpha absorbing systems when previously positive upper limits were reported. Never quite got to the bottom of exactly what went on here, but the statement from the Giovlisco paper says that very likely the differences are due to different error analysis and cosmic ray removal. Cosmic ray removal could be quite important, right, when some of your spectra look like this. There's the Lyman alpha absorption there. Here what you're looking at is a set of cosmic ray hits. It's kind of nasty. So you'd expect, naively, some proportionality between, between Lyman alpha and H-beta flux. Well, there's the H-beta flux in this sample, and there's the Lyman alpha flux. I don't see a degree of proportionality in there. There's um, Lyman alpha over H-beta equals 30 up there. So Lyman alpha, <coughs> weak on average. <coughs> here is um, now a set of correlation plots measured for, here's Lyman alpha, always on the y-axis. You have Lyman alpha over H-beta. Here you're comparing that so you can think of this as kind of an escape fraction. Here I have this 
dotted line up here is just a ratio of 10, so it's about one third the intrinsic value. So the intrinsic value here would be through the ceiling somewhere. <coughs> and on X, we're showing the UV continuum slope, which you may think of very roughly as tracing the, the dust reddening of the stellar continuum. EB minus V derived from the Balmer line, so this is the dust reddening measured in the nebulae. And the metallicity here, and as you see, of course, these properties are all wrapped up together. <coughs> and if you look, you do see a very broad anti-correlation between the Lyman alpha output and these properties. It actually gets a bit better. The year it's showing, these galaxies show a mixture of emission, nebular emission in Lyman alpha, anything above zero. These equivalent widths down here are negative, so that's actually including absorption from the stellar continuum, which you might want to set to zero if you care only about nebular gas. And when you actually remove those points from the diagram, it looks a bit, you know, like, well, if you squint a bit, you could think that the Lyman alpha output is strongest. When the UV slope is bluest, at least the strong Lyman alpha galaxies seem to be selected out of a region, which is a very blue UV slope, has kind of little dust attenuation, and has kind of low metallicity. Um, but of course, this is still Lyman alpha HP to ratio of 10. If you um, actually correct the Lyman alpha flux for, for dust reddening based upon H alpha H beta, um, using a standard dust screen model, you get a line up here. This is 30. Now we're plotting the corrected Lyman alpha H beta ratios against all the same quantities. Here, the dust reddening correction never gets you up to a number of 30. Um, in not one of these cases of 20 galaxies, observed in the low redshift universe, did we, can we get up to, I mean, get up to Lyman alpha outputs that can be fully explained by pure dust attenuation. Um, um, it's combining, which one is this? This is where you do the same thing with the equivalent width. Um, and um, yeah, you see very, very, very broadly a, um, <coughs> uh, well, it's, it's tough to call it a correlation, but you know, maybe there's some brighter stuff up here and some finer stuff down here, maybe. And that's when you cut out the, um, cut out the absorbing galaxies again. Perhaps you could argue that the, the strongest Lyman alpha emitters are drawn from the lower metallicity, low dust content end. But there is a huge amount of spread, right? Roughly these quantities are anti-correlated. I've called this visually anti-correlated because by visually anti-correlated, I mean something that you could kind of identify by eye if you sort of squint a bit and you have that kind of bias already. Um, statistical tests don't give you strong correlations. They're coming in two sigma at the most. I think maybe one of this paper quotes, one actually of these relations gets as far as three sigma significant. But <clears throat> ultimately, they're not strong. And this is, the, of course, the beginnings of the understanding that Lyman alpha radiation transfer is a very, very complicated business, involving dust content, but also involving this large amount of atomic gas. And this H1 can be anywhere, it can be distributed however it wants, and it can be, um, and it can be moving in any way that it wants. And that's what we're going to discuss over the next lectures, this, um, how we actually get at the we kind of try and reduce the dispersion in these diagrams by looking at other, other quantities. Um, that was actually the last, last slide I had. So I can put up my, my summary here and maybe, um, well, I can point out perhaps then that there's only been three satellites returning samples of Lyman alpha fluxes where n is greater than one, and these have been the IUE and Galax and the HST. Um, these have been operating, IUD, IUE operated for something like 20 years and gave us roughly two new galaxies per year. Still difficult to get ultraviolet observations. Um, even in QSOs, Lyman alpha seems suppressed by large factors, up to 10 on average compared to what's expected. The same is true in star, starburst galaxies. Dust corrections do not ever, in any cases for the starbursts, re reconcile um, Lyman alpha fluxes with the intrinsic values, so there must be so Lyman uh, scattering effects must be significant in almost every case, and, but these anti-correlations that are observed between the Lyman alpha output and um, dust reddening and metallicity, they exist, but they're not strong, and yeah, likely radiation transport and a large number of other properties is going to become um, 
well, it's going to be shown to be very important. And that's all I had. So maybe if anyone has any questions or... Really? It's five, what is it? It's 11, 12, isn't it? Yeah, we have 10 minutes per question. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Any questions about the history? Oh, sorry, yeah, hi. Well, that was the one, I mean, yeah, IUE went after, I mean, in the end, they were just pointing at anything, right? Okay, um, there's a, the archives are full of things, but you have to find galaxies that are far enough away that you can actually resolve the Lyman Alpha. And I think that's really the, the source of this. I mean, if you look in these catalogues, these guides of IUE observations, of, these books have thousands of pages in them, but of objects that are far enough away to study Lyman Alpha and actually have decent signal to noise, then the, uh, the catalogues boil down to a much smaller number. I think probably by the end of the mission, you could actually insert a few more galaxies as well. But it doesn't end up being very large, I don't think. I mean, certainly if you look at what's available in the... In, you know, this, you, the spectra that you get are no better quality than in the Galax archives. And there you have 100 Lyman Alpha emitters to go to if you want. The, adding more to the IUE archive is not going to get you there. Uh, if, I'm not going to say that the results have changed very much. I mean, I'm not going to. I'm going to discuss things that go a bit beyond measuring fluxes by themselves, and that's the limit of what you can do at the resolution of the IUE. Um, of course, you know very well that you can see a great deal of detail in Lyman alpha emission spectra when you look at them with the cars. And I'm going to talk about things like that, yeah. I mean, I, here you can only measure, I'm here, these papers to discuss only dust content and metallicity, right? There's no quantitative measurement of the gas, how it moves, how much there is, what the column is. Uh, that didn't exist at this point. So, yeah, I'm going to say some things that are different, but the correlation between Lyman alpha and dust content still exists. Um, okay, so, yeah, in actually, <laughs> I was a bit dishonest in, in, in a sense because... Yeah, oh, well done, well spotted, all right, so... <laughs> okay. God, I don't see what you're talking about now. Um, where is one's okay? Oh, there, yeah, right, right. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it was one of the first indications. In the, when we start looking at high-resolution spectroscopy, one's wiki 18 was the first object that we looked at, and it threw, throws a bit of a spanner in the works. Yeah. Um, one's wiki 18. Um, I was dishonest, right, when I said this was all the IUE sample, because Mauro threw in, um, threw in like a couple of arc of data that had been obtained. GHRS was mounted on HST very shortly before this paper was written and a few objects had been observed. Like, and I think one's wiki 18 was one of them. And maybe a couple of others. I don't think, I don't know actually. This, maybe it was only one HST observation that was included in this paper and it's one's wiki 18 or maybe it's two. Um, and so that's much nearer. Uh, but it, yeah, one's wiki 18 has a, Metallicity in 12 plus uh, whatever log over H, what is it, 7.2 or something? It's extremely low metallicity. It has a H alpha H beta ratio of 2.8, whatever you expect for case, for, um, for case B with zero dust. And it has a Lyman alpha profile that just goes like this to the floor. And you see the damping wings and, um, and the... There's an awful lot of atomic gas in that galaxy, and 
it doesn't seem to be moving very fast. Okay, there are no more questions. Thanks all the uh, speakers again. <clears throat>